Eugene, please let me know when I can get started. Okay, I I speak uh, uh, a little briefing at the start, two three minutes, and we uh, and we start uh, your webinar. Всім доброго дня. Доброго дня. Доброго дня. Добрий день. Добрий. Що ж, шановні колеги, будемо розпочинати наш вебінар. Дякую, що приєдналися. Сьогодні для нас проводить вебінар доктор Раклін Ліндер. Вона є клінічним психологом та визнаним травматерапевтом з Канади. Вона є також колегою вже відомої вам Джудіт Герман, вони працюють разом у спільній консультативній групі, групи з питань травми та дисоціації. Ось ми познайомились з, доктор, з докторкою Ліндер завдяки доктору Джудіт Герман, мали певну передмову та домовились про те, що доктор Ліндер проведе для нашої професійної спільноти певні навчальні вебінари. У нас буде зараз перший вебінар, який стосується особливостей психологічної допомоги для дітей, що зазнали сексуального насильства під час війни. Зараз буде перша частина, а потім то буде друга частина наступного тижня. Ось. Тож я не буду, не буду більше красти час та передаю слово шановній доктор Ліндер. У нас буде, як зазвичай, лекція, ваші питання та відповіді від доктора Ліндер, перерва, потім інша лекція та також питання до відповіді. Тож передаю слово доктору Ліндер, будь ласка. Thank you, Eugene, and hello, everyone, from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada on the other side of the world, nine hours behind you. Before we get going into this webinar, I want to invite you to pay very, very close attention to your own emotional well-being for the next two and a half hours. This is a very, very difficult topic. It was actually very painful for me to even create this training because I did a lot of research above and beyond my own knowledge of trauma. So this training is being recorded. It's going to be on YouTube, available for free on demand. You can watch it whenever you want. So if you find today is not the day It's the end of your work day. It's my morning, but it's your late afternoon. You've been at work all day. Um, if you are tired, if you are overwhelmed, if you've had a difficult day, and this is too much information or too painful information, it's okay to step away and watch this on YouTube at some other time when it's safe. It's very important because the material that I'm going to present today is going to be extremely triggering for some people. So I want to share with you uh, what brought me to this training and, and how I came to be part of this project. 
Um, when the war broke out almost three months ago now, like so many people around the world, I, I thought my heart was going to stop from the shock of it all. And like so many people around the world, I was glued to my computer and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of my day was spent reading everything I could find about what was happening. And it became quite dangerous for me. I am a trauma clinician. I work with very vulnerable people. Many of my clients are survivors of sexual violence, sexual abuse, human sex trafficking. And for the first three weeks of the war, I struggled to stay grounded and present. And I realized it was because I was feeling helpless. I see that somebody has raised their hand. I just want to check and see if there's a question. Is that a question? Can someone tell me? Інна Московчук, ви підняли руку. Якщо щось дуже важливо спитати, зараз, будь ласка, спитайте. Проте запитання будуть після першої лекції доктора Ліндер. Я хочу це для всіх повторити. Можливо, це щось було технічне. Ось. Якщо ні, то, будь ласка, нехай доктор Ліндер продовжує лекцію. Також бачу ще одну руку підняту від Ірини Третяк. Яке питання, будь ласка, швидко питайте. Окей. Юджин, can I continue? Так, 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 будь ласка, продовжуйте, та не переривайтесь, будь ласка, так, все це був технічний момент. It's okay? Okay. It's okay, yes. Okay. So, so, the, the situation for me was one of frozen helplessness. And I myself am a survivor of sexual abuse, which I have spent 20 years in my own life healing. And so the feeling of frozen helplessness was very triggering for me. And I had to find a way through that. And the way through that is through action, through activism, through helping, through mobilization, And so I started looking for opportunities to do something in the face of this horror. And part of this training is my opportunity and everyone else's opportunity to do something in the face of this horror, not just because of the trauma of the war itself and the horrors we are learning about, but because the feeling of frozen helplessness is very, very psychologically dangerous for all human beings. So this information is one thing that we can do among everything that we are already doing to feel a sense of agency in this horrendous situation. So as we move forward, I'm going to talk a little bit about sexual violence and rape in peacetime, how it's different from war rape, it's quite different from war rape, and then the specific situation of children who are raped, um, which is a profound, a profound trauma that has long-term implications in terms of development. So first of all, rape in peacetime. What is this? How does it happen? Why does it happen in the human species? So we do know that sexual violence happens all over the world. And we do know that women and girls and boys and men are raped all over the world and always have been as long as we know our history. Something in our species makes this possible. Something in our culture makes this possible. Something in our societies makes this possible. And fundamentally, one of the things that makes this possible 
is power imbalances. In most societies in the world, even in the 21st century, there are strong elements of patriarchal norms where males are dominant in the society. They are economically dominant quite often. They are culturally dominant. They are often physically dominant. We belong to a sexually dimorphic species. The males of the species are bigger than the females. And so there is an imbalance between that which is large and strong and that which is less large, smaller and less strong. And it is possible for the strong to dominate the weak. So the power imbalance in our society is one of the things that is expressed in sexual violence and peacetime rape. Many people think that rape is about sex. It's almost never about sex. It's almost always about power. Sometimes it's about rage. The other challenge in most human societies is that increasingly, in modernity, in the modern age, more and more, what we have is sexuality as a commodity. And it's very interesting because it isn't really, from a historical perspective, it, it, is, it isn't really about sex per se. It's about the control of particularly female sexuality, particularly female reproduction. Really, it's about who owns the female body and who owns the womb, the uterus in that female body in terms of the control of children and generations, the perpetuation of somebody's genes. And so, Female sexuality has been controlled by men all over the world throughout history for as long as history has been recorded. In the modern age, while women in the law and on paper have more control over their sexual being, it's so so. It's not absolute, even in the modern age. In North America, you may have heard that there are now significant legal battles going on around a woman's right to terminate a pregnancy. And that is still up for grabs. We don't know how it's going to end. We do know that if you walk down a street in many, many parts of the world, what you will see hanging in a store window, and I have seen this everywhere I have traveled in the world, hanging in a store window is women's undergarments that have a particular look to them that make it very clear that women's bodies and women's sexuality is for sale. It's for purchase. Sometimes in the context of commercial sex, sometimes in the context of marriage. But it's not just about procreation and having children and having big families anymore. Now it's more about pleasure. Then we have the idea of dominance as erotic. So for some people in a healthy, consensual, appropriate relationship or sexual situation, for some people, this can be erotic play. The poetry of play and the exchange of power can be erotic, but only with consent. That is not the case when we're talking about sexual violence, when we're talking about rape. That is not consent. 
And what we know in terms of the psychological injury of all sexual violence is that it is the most dangerous form of interpersonal violence known. Rape is the form of interpersonal violence that is most likely to result in post-traumatic stress disorder. It is the form of interpersonal violence that is most likely to result in psychological dissociation. This is when you hear stories of people, they say they leave their bodies. They floated away. They had to escape the situation. And so something happened in the mind and they were gone. That is how dangerous rape is. In my work, I do a lot of teaching and training. I work a lot with police officers, first responders in emergency situations. And I ask audiences all the time, if you had to choose between being very badly beaten so that your arm was broken or your leg was broken, if you had to choose between badly beaten and being raped, which would you choose? And in almost every single case, I've been asking this question for maybe 12 years to different audiences. And the vast majority of people say, I would rather be beaten physically within an inch of my life, but not raped. And I say, why? Why? What is it about rape that is so devastating for us. And I've heard many theories over the years, but my own theory is that when a person is raped, the last line of defense has fallen, it's gone. And what that means is that the physical body itself becomes the scene of the crime. When we are raped, it is not the environment. It's not the surroundings. It's not the room. It's not the bed. It's not the ground. It is the body itself that becomes the scene of the crime. And that body goes with us into the future. Rape is unique in all forms of interpersonal violence. It is unique because we cannot leave the scene of the crime behind us. We take it with us into the future. And so a crucial part of recovery from rape. And I want to say now, next week in part two, we will talk all about healing, how to heal. So it's important to know it's, we can heal, but healing from sexual violence does not involve pretending or brushing it aside or you know, covering your eyes. No, we have to reclaim the body. We have to bring it back. We have to return to it. Our soul has to come back into the body if the soul has left. That is how we recover from sexual violence. And it requires a lot of skill in order to achieve that. So we think about this problem of peacetime rape as already the most catastrophic, the most dangerous form of interpersonal violence in existence. And then we move this problem, this ticking time bomb, we move it into the context of war. And you can imagine that 
the situation just gets worse. So rape during war has some significant features that are different than rape during peacetime. There are some similarities, there is an overlap, but rape during war in some ways is even more catastrophic than the most catastrophic form of interpersonal violence we know of for multiple different reasons. During wartime, one of the aspects of rape that is important to think about is the concept of conquest. So in peacetime rape, we do talk about control, the one who has power and the one who does not have power and controlling that. But in war, what we're talking about is not a control as opposed to a complete annihilation. Rape during war is a sign of contempt. It is a sign of conquest. It is a sign of absolute dehumanization for the victim. Since the first day of the war, every single day I have been reading about what is happening, every single day. And at one point I was so completely overwhelmed, I stopped reading 20, 30 times a day and, and now maybe between five and 10 times I read every day. So I'm trying to sort of bring down the intensity a little bit so that I can function safely in my job. And everywhere I look, everything I've read all over the place, there are narratives of sexual violence that are beyond horrendous, beyond belief, beyond the concept of a human mind to comprehend. And I've been thinking, like so many of us in the world are thinking, what kind of human being could do such a thing, such a crime? I know that today, for the first war crimes um, case in the Ukraine, there was a successful conviction and a lifetime sentence given to the offender, but that's one offender of thousands most of whom have not been identified. And so the question of whether or not justice can be served everywhere is, we don't know, it's tricky. So this idea of conquest is interesting because it's my understanding from the investigations that have happened so far that initially at the start of the war, rape was more random a little bit here and a little bit here and a little bit here and a little bit here. But when Kiev was successfully defended and there was a military withdrawal, it seems that there were landmines that were left, there were bombs that were left, and there was mass rape, as far as the eye could see, in all of the villages and towns that were reclaimed. And based on that information, investigators on the ground have concluded that the sexual violence that has now come to light was not random. It was not spontaneous. There was just too much of it. It was very clearly organized. And it reminded me of that old idea of an abusive partner an abusive spouse who is getting divorced. And if you know anything about domestic violence, you know that divorce is one of the most dangerous times for a woman 
leaving an abusive relationship because it is the time when she is most likely to be murdered by her spouse. And the idea is if I can't have you, no one will. And this is what we have seen emerging from all of the liberated territories in the Ukraine. If I can't have you, nobody will. The other thing about rape during wartime is just the scale of it. We know you cannot be an adult in any society in the world and not know that sexual violence exists. But in most cases, it's sort of below the level of consciousness. It's hidden. It's, you know, one woman over here and another man over there. And so we don't, we don't have to look, we don't have to see. And we don't, we turn away. Most, in most cases, people turn away. They don't, they don't want to know this stuff. But in war rape, the scale is so huge, so massive that we cannot hide. There is nowhere to run. There is no way to avoid it. It's right here. And the witness to violence is also affected, is also a victim. So the scale alone not only means many more people who have been harmed, but also those who are witnesses are being harmed. Yesterday, I watched a video of a man who had rescued a young girl, a child, who had been kidnapped and repeatedly raped. And he cried and he cried and he cried all through the night. And I was watching him crying and I started crying. I cried, he cried, and anybody who sees that video will also probably cry because the scale is so catastrophic. We cannot hide from the harm. One of the very unique features of war rape is that it is frequently public. 90% or more of rape during war is gang rape. It is a performance of rape. It's not just rape, it's rape with an audience. Rape where people are held, held back, tied up, had a gun held to their head and forced to watch what is happening and they cannot move and they cannot speak and they cannot help. There are multiple stories that have come out of liberated parts of Ukraine where people stepped in to try and help someone who was being harmed and being raped and they were killed. This happened in Bucha. People who tried to stop the atrocity were killed and the rapes continued. There are also stories of family members who were held physically or tied up and forced to watch while their family members were being raped. There's a story of two sisters. One was being attacked, somebody else tried, the sister, her sister tried to help. And so they raped both of them and everybody was forced to watch. 
So we have these two sides of a problem. We have the people who are being raped, that's one. The violation of the body, that's one. But also the public humiliation of having all your neighbors, maybe they've known you since you were a child, and now they see your naked body lying in the middle of the street, watching what is being done to you by a gang, as different perpetrators egg one another on. There is a theory, a claim, that the reason that war rape is usually public is to create stronger bonds between soldiers, between teams. So it's designed to frighten everyone. It's designed to humiliate everyone, but it's also designed like a grotesque, disgusting, inhuman group sport. So you have the survivor who is violated if they survive, and often they don't. You have the survivor who is degraded. You have the survivor who is shamed. But then on the other side, you have the witnesses. And witnesses to violence are also victimized because they cannot get the memory out of their minds. In fact, the man in the video that I was watching yesterday, as he was crying, he said, I will not forget what I have seen for the rest of my life. I will not forget the haunting images of atrocity, violence against children, and we are paralyzed and we are helpless. And so for many people, what will happen, not just the image of the violence and the fear, but the guilt and the shame of not being strong enough, not having agency enough to intervene and stop what was happening for people who were frightened that they would be killed. And because so many people have been killed, this is a very legitimate fear. Remembering that I stood and watched this and did nothing. This is something that will haunt people for the rest of their lives. Another unique element of war rape is actually the physical brutality. Some rapes are violent in peacetime. Some rapes in peacetime are less violent. If the survivor is compliant, sometimes rapes are less violent. But in war, rape tends to be extremely physically brutal. Early in the war, a story was told, I, I read on the news, I heard, there was a story of a woman who was gang raped, three, three different perpetrators, all at the same time. All at once. What has been found in the context of war rape is that because the rape is being performed publicly, because people are watching, because soldiers are drinking and laughing and clapping and you know egging people on because of all of these things, each rapist attempts to outperform the one before. Each one attempts to 
sort of beat their chest like men by being more violent, more aggressive, more brutal, causing more physical harm, including internal harm inside the body, body of the victim. It is possible, as we all know, because of this kind of brutality, it is possible to be raped onto death because of the internal damage that can be done. And war rape is notorious for the violence of the style of rape because of the context within which the assaults occur. There is also, in the context of war rape, the idea of sexual slavery. There were a group of women that were found, women and girls, about a month ago now, I think, who had been held, I think about 26 of them, had been held in a basement together and gang raped on a daily basis. Multiple rapists, multiple victims, adults and children, everybody being gang raped around the clock at the same time in the presence of other people. This catastrophe has left apparently nine people, nine survivors, with forced rape pregnancies as a result of their own. Rape camps and sexual slavery during war is actually a well-known phenomenon, <coughs> well-recorded in history, happens in recent times. And we have some evidence that's now coming out of liberated regions of Ukraine that something similar has happened there. This is possible when you have a poisonous cocktail of power, aggression, sexual dominance, competition between soldiers and vulnerable civilians who have nowhere to run. It's important to know and to acknowledge that war rape is primarily perpetrated against women and girls, but not solely. Many, many, many stories have also come out of Ukraine about men and boys being raped. But in the context of men and boys being raped, that is more about power, rage, and degradation we don't usually find slave camps of sex slaves of men. Typically, if sexual slavery is going on, as was the case of those 26 survivors that were finally rescued, usually we're talking about women and girls. We don't actually have knowledge of sexual slavery, typically in peacetime. It can happen but it is not common. It's quite common in war. Now I want to, if you have not heard this term before, introduce the concept of genocidal rape. It's a very, very important concept and it applies in the context of what is happening in Ukraine today. Genocidal rape is when rape is used as a tool of war to destroy a people. And some of the stories that came out of that group of, I believe, 26 victims, survivors who were held in that basement was, it was told to them, and we've heard this in Rwanda and other wars in the world, in Chechnya, we've heard it a lot. We are going to rape you until you never want to have sex again so that you don't bear any Ukrainian children. 
So the object of the rape, of the gang rapes, of the sexual slavery, wasn't just control. It was the annihilation of the future of the Ukrainian people. And that meets the criteria of genocidal rape. And I would argue further that any rape of a child, any rape of a child, falls into the category of genocidal rape because, specifically because children are the future of all nations. And if you kill children or you harm them psychologically enough that they cannot function as healthy adults, using rape as the tool, then in my opinion, that meets the threshold of genocidal rape. There is no question in my mind that what is happening in Ukraine, what has happened, what we fear is still happening. <clears throat> there is no question in my mind that, that this meets the threshold of genocidal rape. And that has significant psychological as well as social consequences that will continue on for generations. It's not that we cannot address it successfully, we can, but the meaning of what has happened will now be part of the story of the Ukrainian people until the dawn, until the sunset of the age. It will not go away. We will not forget. None of us will forget what has happened here. Now, before we go into questions, I just want to go to three toxic myths. <clears throat> there are a lot of myths that come out of sexual violence. There are a lot of myths that come out of war and there's a lot of myths that come out of war rape that I would like to address so that we can get some clarity around some key things. So the three toxic myths, there are others, and we can talk about them a little bit more in the Q&A. Um, but the three that I want to address specifically, one is the narrative or the question about same gender rape. And the idea that if a boy is raped by a male soldier, or if a man is raped by a male soldier, that somehow this traumatic experience will change something so deeply inside the survivor that they will switch from being a heterosexual person to a homosexual person? And the answer is that is not correct. That is not accurate. Human sexuality, a significant portion of human sexuality is actually created in the uterus of your mother. It is related to the genetic code that you inherit from your ancestors. It's also related to your mother's hormonal balance, the state of hormones inside your mother's body while you're in her stomach at different stages of brain development when the mother is still pregnant. We know that sexual practices, how sexuality is expressed, has very strong social influence. What I say, what I don't say, what I tell you, what I don't tell you, what I prefer, what I don't prefer, what is okay and what is not okay, a lot of that is cultural. But the drive, in terms of whether I desire women or I desire men, 
if I'm a man who loves women or loves men or loves both, that is primarily biological. So if I am a heterosexual boy who likes girls or a man who likes women and I am raped by a man, that will not change my desire for girls or for women. What it can change is my ability to express healthy sexuality. And the reason is for women to be raped is a catastrophe. But because of the stigma around rape, and because of the stigma around same gender rape, which is even greater, the shame and the humiliation of having been raped at all by a man can severely interfere with healthy sexual expression in boys and in men in the same way that it can affect girls and women. So it's not about what I desire, it's more about whether I have any kind of any intimate contact whatsoever, because I cannot stand it. Because of the very physicality of rape, one of the most profound trauma triggers is your sense of smell. This is the, of all of the senses, your sense of smell is the most likely to create flashbacks. And sexual intercourse of any kind, consensual or non-consensual, has a lot of sense associated with it the smell of the body, the scent of the offender, the scent of sweat, the scent of semen. All of these things can become trauma triggers for anyone, female or male, who is sexually assaulted. So the concern we have when we're working with boys and men who've been raped is not are they going to become homosexually oriented after the fact when they weren't before? Our real concern is how can we facilitate healing that makes it possible for them to have a healthy sexual identity after the trauma? We have the same concern for all genders and all ages because of the devastating nature of sexual violence in any form. The other myth that I want to address is the claim or the story or the narrative that somehow, some way, survivors could have prevented the rape, especially if they were male. They could have fought, they could have stopped it, they should have been stronger, et cetera, et cetera. This is a complete myth. This is an absolute myth. In the context of gang rape, if you don't submit, you will die. End of story. People who tried, we know, tried, to fight the gang rapes that have occurred and been discovered. In mass graves, people who were executed, there's very clear evidence from the forensic examinations of the bodies that many of the people who have been removed from mass graves in the last month were in fact raped before they were killed. We know this, this has been shown. So, there are six mammalian responses to threat that we need to address when we're talking about the myth survivors could have pre prevented the rape. Realistically, quite often, they can't. 
And that is terrifying for all of us. The idea that such an atrocity can occur and we can't do anything, we are helpless in the face of atrocity is devastating. And so it's easier to tell ourselves, well, they could have, they could have done something different. Well, let's talk about the six mammalian responses to threat. The first mammalian response to threat, this is not just human beings, this is animals too. The first mammalian response to threat is actually, don't be in a situation. Avoid, avoid, avoid. Well, that does not work very well if your country is being invaded. Because every single Ukrainian that has been raped in the last three months was not aggressing on anyone. They were home, they were with their families, they were at work, they were doing nothing but working and paying their taxes. They were not looking for violence. Violence found them. So avoidance, which is the first mammalian response to threat, the first defense was not an option. The second mammalian response to threat is something called attentive immobility, which is be very, very quiet and alert and maybe they won't find you. And a lot of people tried that. We've heard story after story after story after story of people hiding in their basements, hiding in abandoned buildings, staying very, 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 very quiet for long periods of time, except to go out and get some water or some food. They tried that. Attentive immobility is a viable response to threat unless the aggressor knows where to find you. So when soldiers were kicking in people's front doors and searching the house and stealing all their property and going into their basements where there was nowhere else to run, people were discovered. So the second mammalian response to threat did not work. They were found. Some people successfully hit, many people were found. Now, we hear a lot about the concept in trauma of fight flight. But in fact, from a biological and evolutionary perspective, it's actually the reverse. It's actually flight fight. And the reason for this is the third mammalian response to threat is to run away from the threat. And at last count, I believe about 6 million people six million Ukrainians have been displaced from their homes and their jobs and their communities because they use the third response, which is to run from the violence. And the advantage of running from the violence unless you are executed in the middle of a humanitarian corridor, which we've also heard about a lot of people were killed deliberately. A lot of civilians were killed deliberately trying to escape the violence. This is clearly a war crime. There's no question. This is a war crime. So when we're running away from the danger, our likelihood of survival physically increases, but the mental health toll is catastrophic because of the survivor guilt that haunts people, really as long as they live, if they don't get very, very good trauma intervention. So running away is absolutely an option. The fourth mammalian response to threat is to fight. And many people stayed behind to fight the occupation of Ukraine. Many have lost their lives. So while fighting can be very effective in response to threat, it is an expensive response to threat. That's why it's number four of six, because the risk of death is very real and it is significant. And even if you don't die, the risk of permanent injury is significant. I was looking at some photographs of the heroes of Mariupol and it's very, people have lost legs and limbs and they don't, didn't have any medication and, but they were alive. They had been catastrophically harmed, but they were alive. Now here's what becomes very important. 
for the purposes of the question, survivors could have prevented rape, which is not accurate. This is a complete myth. The fifth mammalian response to threat is called appeasement. And appeasement is when we understand we cannot avoid, we cannot hide, we cannot run, we cannot fight for a million reasons. We don't have ammunition, we're not physically strong enough, we're too old, we're too young, we're disabled. Appeasement is the fifth mammalian response to threat and its function is to de-escalate the level of violence so that we can live to run or fight another day. And so the narrative that somehow people who were sexually violated should have done something, escaped, run, fought off the rapist, not given in, not lay there, not appease, this is not true. Because if they're alive at all to tell the story, if they are still breathing, that is a victory. In all cases, if they're still breathing, that is a victory. And if appeasement was the survival strategy they used and it worked because they're still breathing, that is a victory. And it must be understood as such. The sixth mammalian response to threat is called tonic immobility. This is the mouse in the jaws of a cat. Tonic immobility is an ancient evolutionarily conserved survival strategy in which our entire physiology shuts down almost like we're dead. So evolution has the ability to make us just play dead. And I read this week a story of a man who was shot in the face and buried alive. And his brother's body was sitting on top of him, which is what allowed him to have a little bit of an air pocket because he was dumped into a mass grave with the rest of his family members. But the reason he is still here to tell his story is because he went into a completely dead-like state. So he was dumped in the grave, the perpetrators went away, and he dug himself out and he escaped. So those are the six responses. In Ukraine, we've seen all six responses used in the context of sexual violence and rape. The most common response for those who lived might have been that fifth response of appeasement, but likely also tonic immobility, that frozen helpless, there's nobody here, I'm completely dissociated response, which is the other common response to sexual violence. I say to you again, no matter what has happened, no matter how many people were involved, and no matter who saw, if that individual is still breathing, that is a victory. Because what it means is that genocidal rape was not successful. The third myth that I really want to stress before we go into Q and A is that nobody heals from rape. That is not true. Thank heaven, it is not true. Lots of people heal from rape. It is absolutely possible to heal from rape. It is possible to heal from more rape. It is not easy. It's quite difficult, but it is possible. And so this idea of genocidal rape and the destruction of the Ukrainian people and their children and their future and their nation 
through the mechanism of genocidal rape will not come to pass. It will not come to pass because yes, many people have died, many children have died, but many people have also survived. And even when they have been catastrophically harmed in the trauma field, more and more, certainly in the last 10 or 15 years, we know more and more and more about how to help facilitate healing in the context of these catastrophic forms of trauma. We know how to help, we know what to do, and we even know what we could do on a mass scale. And next week's training, next Monday, for part two of this training, all we're going to talk about is the many, 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 many tools and techniques and resources, some of which are not very expensive, that we can use in order to recover from what has happened. Okay, so we're now at the time for Q&A. So let me just scroll to the chat and see if we have any questions before we go to our break. Колеги, якщо у вас є питання, будь ласка, поставте, і наша перекладач Софія напише їх, напише переклад для Жаклін, і вона дасть відповідь. Якщо питань немає, то ми продовжимо далі. I said about questions, if any of our participants has, has or had them, they could write to the chat, and mm -hmm. our translator uh, chat, uh, chat you write uh, write it on your chat and you could uh, and you will read it and uh, get any any response uh, if uh, we don't have any questions we uh, we can go to the rest uh, and have a break for 15 minutes okay we'll give a few minutes to see if anybody is typing we could also just go to the break sometimes people need to step away and digest it's a lot um, and then we could take a break and then have questions when we return. Oh, it looks like something. Yes, we so have a question and now Sophia will translate it. Okay. Uh, we have uh, no questions. Uh, it's uh, this question was about uh, some uh, pr organized process. Uh, so, uh, so uh, I think we uh, we can take uh, a break. Okay. Can we uh, ten minutes or fifteen minutes? What do you think? Fifteen minutes. Fifteen. Fantastic. Okay. Okay. Колеги, наразі в нас перерва 15 хвилин, повертаємося о 6.15, 6.18.
Well, and I just want to check and see if we have any questions from the break. Uh, Olena, to be выключен микрофон. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eugenia. I uh, now Eugene. Um, uh, now Eugene is going to say about that that you have an opportunity to ask uh, to give answers to the questions in chat. And after that, we uh, we could uh, start the lecture again. Okay. 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 Так, тоді я можу зачитати питання, так? Okay. Так, е, перше питання, е, доктор Ліндер. Чи, працю, чи працювали ви онлайн із клієнтами? Ну, тобто, я так розумію, з тематикою так, сексуального насильства з, з дітьми. І які... Є особливості. Це перше питання. I see two questions. The first is the question of mass violence being um, it, it's so prevalent. Uh, does is that helpful or harmful? It's both. Trauma, it's often both. Because everyone is talking about it that can help to lower the stigma. Hmm? Most rape is secret, it's shameful, it's hidden, and the survivor has to carry it inside themselves, but they don't, they don't speak. In the context of this conflict, we are all speaking about it, the problem is now it's so loud. So those who've experienced the rape, they can't hide. There's no rest. There's no respite. Sometimes we don't want to talk about it, but you can't help because now you're reading it everywhere. So it's a double-edged sword, as is the case with trauma, two sides, right? What we can do is say, speaking about it at the social level will change the environment in which the healing can occur at the big, big systems level, it will mobilize resources, it will mobilize communities, it will get people acting to help with the healing. But even when rape occurs in public, it remains a private experience inside the body of the survivor. And they, for their dignity, must also have time to step away from the trauma and not talk about it and not think about it all the time. So it's a middle ground. We, we don't want to be too far talking about it all the time or never talking about it. We want to try and find a middle ground. And this is a fluid and difficult path to walk because we will hear more of these stories. We know this we will hear more of these stories. And every time we hear another bucha, everybody is going to be triggered and those who have experienced it themselves even more so. That's the first question. The second is online, yes, um, COVID. I have, I have worked almost exclusively online um, 
through telehealth, which is like Zoom, but for, for doctors um, for two years and it's fine. It's completely fine because the human heart is virtual. I am right now in this moment, I am on the other side of the world, nine hours behind you in a completely different culture, in a different season even. The snow just melted a month ago here. But my heart is with you on the other side of the world in time and has been for three months. After my first three weeks of shock trauma with the war, I was desperate to find something I could do, something I could do so I didn't feel helpless. And so down in Kyrgyzstan region in Russian occupied Kyrgyzstan, there's an animal shelter down there. Um, I, I love animals. I'm an animal lover. I have six cats. I love them. Um, and so in Kirsten region, two months ago, I found an animal shelter and, and I adopted them. And so I help in terms of funding, buying food, this kind of thing. I wanted to do something. I wanted to do this webinar. Everyone who feels helpless has to do something. In the virtual sphere, what you will find is that the human heart crosses through time and space. It makes no difference if you're physically or just virtually emotionally with the person. It works equally well. Any other questions? А, так, тут ще є одне питання, можливо, вже була відповідь від доктора Ліндер така імпліцитна, але я все, все ж таки зачитаю. А, так. Тот факт, что массовое насилие сейчас говорят публично, не замалчивает, может ли в перспективе помочь тем, кто пережил насилие, либо, напротив, усложнит их выздоровление? Вот такой вопрос. Софія, чи можете ви перекласти пані Лінда Ручаті, щоб вона могла відповісти на це питання? Так, так я, я зрозумів, просто я його не зачитав. Тоді з питаннями все, то доктор Ліндер може продовжувати, будь ласка, так. Ми можемо почати нашу лекцію знову. Окей. Ми маємо питання. Окей. All right. So now, now, so we have this context for rape. We have a context for war rape. Now we're going down into the deeper, darker area of children specifically and what happens to them when they are raped. So we want to think of war rape as a very severe form of developmental trauma. So all developmental trauma, all of it is very dangerous. There are people who think that the bombs that have gone off and the buildings that have been destroyed and the people that have been killed are the worst kind of trauma. It's a very severe form of trauma. The difference is adults have a different capacity to deal with trauma than children. Developmental trauma is the worst form of trauma, even in the interpersonal context, because the child's physical body and brain the nervous system and the brain, the physical brain itself are still being wired. The brain, the physical brain, the prefrontal cortex, really for those of you who have children, um, it doesn't finish really doing all its wiring until early 20s. And so from the perspective of developmental trauma, this is a problem for us because I like to use the metaphor of jello. 
Olena, I can't. Tell me that Jello is common in Ukraine. Is it? Jello, the dessert. Jello? Jello dessert? Uh, it's, like, it's like a pudding. Ah, dessert, pudding, yes. Okay, okay. So imagine, this is my metaphor. Imagine that we have pudding and you're baking pudding and you take a cup of white powder and you pour it into the pudding mix and you stir it around and you bake it. And then when you take it out, you go to taste it and it tastes terrible because the cup of white powder was salt, not sugar. And the salt was poured into the pudding and mixed and mixed and mixed and baked right in. The question is, how do you remove the salt from the pudding after it's baked? How do you take it out? How do you delete it? And the answer is, you can't. It's not possible. This is developmental trauma in children. Because of the developmental stage that they are in, children are extraordinarily vulnerable to all forms of trauma, including sexual violence and absolutely war rape. Children are still growing their bodies. They're still wiring their brains. They're still developing their identities and their personalities. And so trauma in childhood enters in and locks into the child. And if it's not dealt with, can have significant negative effects for the rest of the child's life. This is one of the things that makes the war rape of children a clear form of genocidal rape. Because when you harm children, you harm the future of a nation. And war rape is a severe form of developmental trauma. Developmental trauma produces very, very concerning symptoms if it's not dealt with. For example, when we think about developmental trauma, usually it's of an interpersonal nature. Although I would argue that even a child, the children in the basements, in the subways that were hiding and listening to bombs, even though those weren't soldiers with guns, that would have been very, very, very scary for children. But traditionally, when we talk about, traditionally, when we talk about developmental trauma, we're talking about between people. So this is particularly concerning in the case of war rape. What interpersonal violence in developmental trauma can do or interpersonal violence against children can do is it can induce a profound, profound sense of rage. Children know when bad things are happening to them. They don't know why quite often, but they know bad things are happening to them. And while in the moment of the rape, they probably feel pain, fear, terror, helplessness, after the fact, they often feel rage. We all feel rage. I feel rage. Many of you feel rage. The child also feels rage. 
And that affects their brain chemistry and it affects their physical brain development and it affects everything else. So rage is one of the primary emotions that comes out of developmental trauma like worry. Fear is another. So what you may find is children who have great difficulty managing their emotions and they're, they're hitting their mothers and running away, but also you will find children who are so frightened that they want to sleep with their parents if their parents are still alive. Many orphans have been left without family as a result of the war. So children might end up so paralyzed by fear that they want to sleep underneath the bed. They don't want to come out of the basement. <clears throat> they don't feel safe. They want to sleep in the closet because it's dark and they can close the door and feel like they're hidden. There are long-term consequences of this in terms of the child's psychosocial development. We are a social species. And the most important thing to know, the most important thing to know is the number one protection against post-traumatic stress disorder after trauma exposure is not counseling. It's not therapy. It's not a trauma psychologist. It is social support. And the reason for this is from an evolutionary perspective, we are a social species. In our DNA, we are wired to connect, to help, support, bond. And if we struggle with extreme fear as a result of trauma, it becomes very difficult to do that. So children may experience nightmares, night terrors, flashbacks, screaming wetting the bed, not wanting to eat. Many, 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 many things can happen when children are very frightened. The other thing about being a child in the middle of a war who has been raped is every single human being who is raped experiences helplessness, no matter your gender or your age. But post-rape, if you survive it, if you are an adult, you have an opportunity to restore your sense of independence, your sense of power, your sense of confidence, because you are an adult. When you are a child who is raped, this is not an option. When you are a child who is raped, depending on your age, you have the helplessness of the rape itself and you have the helplessness of the developmental stage. If you're raped at the age of 11, and we know stories already. We've heard stories of 11-year-olds who have been raped in this war. You still have many, many, many years where you are dependent on other people for your survival. 11-year-olds don't traditionally survive on their own. They need a lot of support and a lot of care. So we have the war rape is compounded by childhood. And so the sense of helplessness may continue to persist and persist and persist. This is very, very dangerous. There are things we can do to correct it, but the situation is very dangerous because when we're helpless, the whole 
physical nervous system of a human being. It just wants to shut down. Then we have depression. Then we have dissociation. Then we have people who don't want to get out of bed and eat, et cetera, et cetera. So the problem of children who are raped in war is their helplessness is twofold. It is a dangerous, toxic, maybe even deadly form of helplessness, not the joyful helplessness of a healthy childhood when you have parents who love you and protect you. In many cases, we have heard stories of whole families being raped in the presence of one another. The idea that anybody can keep me safe is gone. And there is a real risk it's gone forever. So steps have to be taken. It's very, very important that we have interventions at that point. Then there is the shame of rape. There is such a stigma around sexual violence in almost every human culture. I've never really understood why I have worked in sexual assault centers. I work in human sex trafficking. I did a brief period of work working with inmates in a men's prison. Many, so many of my male clients in the prison had been raped that I had to start a secret rape survivor group inside the prison for these clients, and we could not tell anybody what we were doing. We called it the, the art therapy program, the art therapy group, because the shame of the men would have made them victimized with other men in the prison. Children also experience deep shame when they have been raped. Both genders experience this. The problem is that the identity of children is still being developed. So it's the problem of the pudding. If you put the salt into the pudding and mix it in and then bake it, if you put the shame into the child and then mix it in and then bake it, there is a significant risk that the child will not say, I am Jackie. They will say, I am shame. The shame is so toxic that it can interfere with healthy identity development in children setting them up for low self-esteem for the rest of their lives, low self-esteem, low self-compassion are highly correlated with many forms of mental health issues, including depression, anxiety, so on and so forth down the line. Interestingly enough, negative self-talk or saying, bad things to yourself is one of the things that can perpetuate post-traumatic stress disorder, separate from all of the other things going on with post-traumatic stress disorder. Negative self-talk is one of the things that will allow the symptoms to continue. One of the greatest dangers of developmental trauma, including war rape to children, is the self-hatred that becomes their identity after they have been violated, after they have been degraded, after their dignity has been stolen and their bodily integrity has been stolen from them. And so a huge hole can open up inside the child and shame pours in like a river. 
and wants to steal the soul of that child in the same way that the use of genocidal rape is trying to steal the soul of the Ukrainian people. And we cannot allow this to happen. We cannot allow it. The other part, the other piece of war rape in children is betrayal. Most, not all children, because it depends on the family of origin. But most children come from a family where somebody loved them. Not everyone, but most. And when somebody loved them and somebody protected them, they grow up in a world feeling like Okay, I have a defender. If a monster is coming to get me, my daddy will protect me, my mommy will protect me. In the context of war rape against children, that does not happen. When children are raped during war, their mommy and their daddy, and their big brother, and their big sister, and their friend, and their friend's mommy, and their teacher, and their coach could not save them. And children never forget the moment when they realize no help is coming. That is forever. They never forget it. They can learn to live with it. They can learn to thrive in spite of it, but they will not forget. And something is broken inside the child when they realize that what they believed in, what they trusted to keep them safe does not have the power to do so. The betrayal is so profound that it can affect their relationships down the line. So what is the result of this? It is not a surprise to anyone on this call that children who are raped during war will have significant emotional challenges after the fact. Some of the emotional challenges are just basic biology. Every human body, regardless of the culture that you live in, the country that you live in, or the age that you are, every human body has an autonomic nervous system that is built to respond to danger. We cannot turn that off. This is evolution. We are built to respond to danger. And when danger finds us and we cannot escape it, and we are harmed by that danger in childhood, there are fundamental changes that happen to the nervous system of the child as well as the physical brain of the child. And those changes in the state of the body and in the physical wiring of the brain can show up as the child having difficulty managing their emotions. They're crying all the time, they're shouting all the time, they're screaming all the time, they're hitting all the time. This is a natural and quite a appropriate response to war rape. The problem is that the challenges continue long, 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 long 
after the rape is over. That is one of the reasons that the war rape of children is genocidal rape, because it is, it does, it's not one point in time. The rape happens at one point in time, but the injury of the rape continues on and can continue on for many, many, many years. So emotional challenges are one of the outcomes. Physical challenges are another. Because children's bodies are small when they are raped, there's a lot of physical injury, especially in war rape where the rapes tend to be violent and brutal. And so we are talking about the need for medical intervention for a lot of children. We're talking about the need for ongoing medical intervention for a lot of children. But that's just the physical aspect of the rape itself. When children are raped and betrayed and violated and not protected and learn that they are helpless and publicly humiliated and shame comes pouring in and self-hatred replaces self-compassion, many, many children will look in the mirror and they will hate what they see. And if they hate what they see, there is a risk that they will begin to engage in self-harming behaviors, like cutting themselves, like burning themselves with cigarettes, like plucking out their hair, plucking out their eyebrows, plucking out their eyelashes. A lot of people self-harm in parts of the body where nobody can see, like using razor blades to cut in between their toes because nobody looks between toes for scars. So there isn't just the memory of the harm of the rape itself, the event, there is the ongoing harming that the child can engage in as a psychological response to the rape. And this can create a lot of physical and medical issues. Behavioral challenges are incredibly common in children who've experienced developmental trauma, including war rape. Because when children are shown that they are helpless, in the act of being raped, they are helpless. When they are shown that their parents don't have the capacity to keep them safe, the betrayal of that. One of the things that can happen with their rage is it can be pointed inside and they go into self-hatred, but it can also be pointed outside and they go into violent hatred of the world, violent hatred of the people around them. So children who are harmed in war, especially war rape, may be children who start hitting other children in school, acting out in school, attacking in school, on the playground. It is quite common outside the context of war rape for children with developmental trauma to grow into bullies. They hurt other kids. They're being hurt. They pass on the hurt. It's a, it's a way to get the rage outside of them. It's a way to live out the rage, act out the rage, but it's also a way to help them feel more powerful. So first in the war rape, they were helpless. They had no power. Now, when they're very violent and aggressive, that's when they start to feel less helpless. And the, the strength that can be created from that violence becomes a loop. It feeds itself 
I hit you, I feel better. So now I'll hit you twice and I'll feel more powerful. Now I'll hit you three times and so on and so on and so on and so on. Violence breeds violence in children. This is well known. There are also a lot of cognitive challenges that can occur as a result of worry. The cognitive challenges are actually caused because when a child has been harmed and a child has been raped, their physical body goes into a fight flight state. So it's important to remember that all trauma is encoded physically in the body, in the nervous system, in the physical brain. So the emotional, the cognitive, all of the challenges are like software, but trauma damages the hardware first. And then we have software problems if the body is like a computer. So children who have been harmed children who've been raped in war have difficulty focusing. Their their brain is all over the place. They have difficulty remembering. Their brain is all over the place. They have difficulty studying, staying on task. And it's because on the inside, their physical nervous system is not relaxed. It does not feel safe. How can I feel safe when my body has been violated and I bring this crime scene to school every day? How can I possibly learn anything? So the cognitive challenges that we see in children are not learning disorders and they're not the child not obeying or not wanting to study, it's so overwhelming inside the body of a traumatized child that it's impossible to focus on anything out in the world. So we see a lot of challenges in terms of cognitive problems with children with developmental trauma and usually they're diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. But very often, that is not what is happening. Very often, what they have is juvenile post-traumatic stress disorder. Of course, this makes sense in the context of war rape. Relationship challenges are also very important when we're talking about child war rape. The reason is that when children are very young, for those of you who have kids, when kids are very young, they want their mom and they want their dad. But as they get older, they don't really want their mommy and their daddy, they want their friends. So it's important for all human beings to go through a stage of peer bonding, having friends your own age. Because your friends your age show you what it's like to be a child. Your parents don't remember. That's 20 years ago for them. They don't think about it. So Kids love their parents, but they need to be with their friends. But if I am a child and I was raped in the war and my friend was not, there's a separation. There's a breaking. I can't talk about what happened to me. I can't tell you what happened to me. I can't speak it. I'm so humiliated. And so we can find quite often that children with developmental trauma 
start to isolate. They leave their peer groups, they separate from their peer groups. And in the context of the war, because so many people have had to move to so many different places, support systems are breaking down all over. So maybe you were my friend and I could tell you, but now I have to move to another city and you've moved to another country. So the loss of the peer bond, the friendship with my friend is gone. So relationships break down in the context of developmental trauma, particularly when people and families are moving all over the place. So one possible protection might be a friend I trusted. Maybe I can't tell you what happened, but maybe I can sit with you and you can just be my friend. But now you're in a different country. I'm in Germany and you're in Poland. Well, I don't have any friends to sit with me now. I don't have anybody I can trust. So the natural capacity of these peer groups, these child friendship groups to support one another is breaking down in the context both of the violence as well as the refugees. Children are losing their sense of safety, but they're also losing their support systems in the war. The negative sense of self, which comes out of this process is profound. And unfortunately, when children develop a negative self, sense of self, it can last for the rest of their lives okay. if it's not corrected. It can be a permanent injury if it's not corrected. So it's so important to intervene early. The long-term risks are as follows. Self-hatred, self-blame. Many years ago, I worked in a sexual assault center. And I was working with a young woman who had been raped. And I was a young therapist at the time. I meant well, I really wanted to help. And so this client repeatedly told me what a terrible person she was, how it was her fault that she had been raped, that she should have done more to stop the attack that she should have told people after the fact. And her self-hatred and her self-blame were so extreme that I could not stand it. I couldn't bear it. And so I worked very, very hard to convince her that it was not her fault. And I made a very strong case for this was not your fault. And in my office, in my presence, when I thought I had finally convinced her it was not her fault, she stopped talking. She stopped moving. And she sat back in the chair and just stared blankly and did not say a word. This went on for several minutes and I became quite concerned. I did not know what was happening. I came to understand years later that self-hatred has a stabilizing function in the psychology of many 
developmental trauma survivors. It's like a wall in the building. And I learned from that case that when a client has self-hatred, we have to be very, very careful how we modify it. I realized after, years later, that what had happened was when she was engaging in self-hatred and self-blame, she was also telling herself a story. And the story was, if I had been strong enough, if I had been fast enough, if I had been brave enough, then I would not have been raped. And that story gave her a sense of power. I can change my situation. Next time somebody attacks me, I just have to be strong enough and brave enough to fight them off and I will be okay. That is essentially what she was telling herself. And when I told her, when I convinced her, it was not your fault, you did nothing wrong, you don't have to hate yourself. You don't have to blame yourself. What she became aware of was no matter what I had done, I was going to be helpless. And so when she gave up her self-hatred, she also gave up her power. And all that was left was helplessness which meant that the next time somebody attacked her, she was probably still going to be helpless and she would probably be harmed again. And so this caused her to completely shut down. And I came to understand from that case that self-hatred and self-blame must be handled very, very, very carefully in the context of healing because it does serve a function. It is a high cost strategy and has a lot of problems associated with it and can do a lot of damage. But on the other side, and it's a two-edged sword, on the other side, self-hatred can help protect people from feeling helpless. And that too is important to consider. In the legacy of developmental trauma and war rape in children, self-hatred and self-blame are two of the most common injuries that we will see. We will also likely see because of the betrayal that happens for the child, when they realize their mommy, their daddy, their grandpa, their big sister, their neighbor was not strong enough to protect them from harm. The distrust that can grow from that is significant. And it might not look like a child saying to their mother, why didn't you protect me from my rapist? Almost no child will say that. But what you will see in the family dynamic is a possible breakdown of the trust in the parent. You might see an increase in the child isolating you might see an increase in the child keeping secrets from their parents. You might see an increase in the child walking away instead of moving towards the family. All of this comes from why didn't you keep me safe?
why didn't you protect me? You are my parents. It's your job to protect me. And you failed. And this is very real for children. And because they are children, if they start to believe that they cannot trust their families, if they still have families, this changes their sense of safety in the world, which could lead to increased levels in anxiety in the world, among other things. Loss of trust in social systems is another very important consideration. Because at the end of the day, the social system is the big family. So my mommy and my daddy, my brothers and my sisters, my grandparents, my aunties and my uncles, that's the small family. There is a big family called the Ukrainian family. The family of Ukraine which is now filled with people who have been murdered, who have been raped, whose property has been stolen, whose infrastructure has been destroyed. So when a child is hiding in the basement of a subway with everyone else in the city, they look around and they can see that the adults are vulnerable also. The social systems are vulnerable also. And what that might mean to children depends on the child because individual children encode trauma differently, even if they have the same traumatic experience. That might mean I can't trust anybody. I can't trust my parents. I can't trust my school. I can't trust my hospital. I can't trust my city. I can't trust anybody because nobody is strong enough to keep me safe in this situation. That too can induce severe anxiety and fear in children. And children who are frightened have negative mental health outcomes down the line. There's also the problem in the context of war rape of who my perpetrator was. In today's major decision, the first war crimes trial where someone was found guilty and sentenced to life imprisonment, we found one perpetrator. But the vast majority of survivors of war rape, their perpetrators will get away. There will be no justice for many of them because we don't always know who the perpetrators are, but also many perpetrators have now been killed in the war. So the child has been violated and they have no justice. What does justice and fairness look like for a child who's experienced this? Children know fairness from very, very young. Under the age of two, children have been shown to be consciously aware of what fairness is and what it looks like. And in the context of war, a lot of children will not experience fairness. And that can leave a sense of anger inside them that becomes very problematic as they continue to age into adolescence and young adulthood. Problems in school will likely be seen because of all of the difficulty concentrating, all of the difficulty of the hypervigilance of the traumatized body. So children will have a lot of difficulty just sitting still in a chair. When you have developmental trauma, your physical body is very uncomfortable and it's hard to sit still and it's hard to focus. So one of the outcomes of war rape in children and genocidal rape in children 
is educational problems in school. So we have to start thinking about how to adapt school curriculums to be trauma informed, to account for all of the traumatized school children that need to continue to learn. Problems in the family are again, a significant problem. And this is because if a child is raped in war, the parents, if they're alive, will be aware of this. So the child may feel betrayed, but the parents will also feel enraged, guilty, helpless, maybe even ashamed. And so this is going to create pressure on the relationship between the parent and the child at a time when the family system is a crucial protective factor in terms of trauma recovery. But war rape in, rape in general, but war rape in particular and war rape in children is like a bomb blowing up inside the family and everyone will struggle to adapt. Friendships will likely break down. Long-term children who have developmental trauma, if the trauma is not addressed in childhood, which it can be, and there are ways to do it successfully, but if the trauma is not addressed in childhood, the earlier we intervene, the better outcomes long-term. When the child grows, and they become a teenager and then a young adult, what we often see is a legacy of mental health issues that are tied to the traumatic experience, the difficulty with emotional regulation, the difficulty with concentrating and focus, the difficulty with behavior, that can turn into difficulty with employment. If I am angry all the time and I am punching people all the time, and I am yelling all the time because my trauma is unresolved and I am unable to self-regulate, then the likelihood of maintaining employment gets smaller. If I am depressed and cannot get out of bed, then the likelihood of maintaining employment gets smaller. And so down the line without intervention, there are significant employment and economic impacts to war rape in children. Legal problems, of course, for anyone who is struggling to manage their emotions and they feel betrayed and they feel enraged and they feel powerless, which could make them more violent. There's a strong relationship, by the way, between shame, internalized shame, and violent external behavior. The children who are harmed today are at risk for legal problems tomorrow. Revictimization is another concern. Because when you have been traumatized, when you have been raped, when you have been degraded, when you have been violated and nobody stopped it, and now you are filled with shame and self-hatred and self-loathing, you are very, very vulnerable to predators later on. So the children that have been war raped now could potentially, because of their emotional challenges, their mental health challenges, their social challenges, could be extremely vulnerable in five, seven, or 10 years to other people like human traffickers trying to re-victimize them. So, Effectively treating war rape in children is one of the most important things 
that we have to do in response to what has happened over the last three months. It is crucial to society's future because the rape of Ukraine's children is a form of genocide. It is not something that can be allowed. It is not something that we can avoid. It is a devastating form of trauma and it is really overwhelming for a lot of people to work in. Nevertheless, we must address the problem. We must address it as early in development as we can, as quickly as we can. I will tell you in terms of next week's, next week's webinar that there are many, 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 many things we can do to improve the situation for Ukraine's children at the community level, at the professional level, and even at the personal self-help level. And we'll talk a lot about those techniques next week. In the meantime, I just want to thank you all for your attention. I know this has been a very difficult webinar, very painful. Thank you for staying with me through it. And now I'm happy to take any questions from the audience. Uh, Dr. Linder, our translator Katya will send you several questions to chat. Please check it. Okay. Ah, so number one, how to restore a child's faith in parents or adults. Okay. Most parents on this call will have done everything they can to ensure their children are not harmed. But sometimes no human being has enough power to stop evil. Sometimes we are all helpless and all we can do is hold on and hope we survive. And if we survive, then we take action. The restoration of trust in parents does not look like pretending that trauma did not happen. We cannot change the past. Trauma is with us. It's now with us forever. All of us, all adults, all children, it's here forever. What parents can do rather than say, there is no trauma. And the child says, but there are monsters under my bed. The parent has to say, yes, there are monsters under your bed. And yes, they are very scary. But if you come here to me, I will hold you as close as I can, as tight as I can, as long as I can. I will hold you until the monsters are gone. That is all we have for children. We cannot save them from evil. We can only be brave enough to sit next to them in the darkness. And we say to them, it is dark here, but you are not alone. That is how we restore trust. Not by trying to be strong when we're not strong. Not by hiding our tears when we want to cry. 
I have cried nonstop for three months. Every time I have seen and witnessed what has happened, I have cried. I am crying still, but I am with you. In my tears, in my grief, in my pain and my sorrow, I am with you and you will be with them. And that is what will make the difference. One moment. Okay. Is it reasonable to work with a child together with the parent if the rape happened in the presence of the parents? Probably necessary sometimes for the child's trust and parents' authority. Ah, okay. This is question two. Yes, I would strongly recommend if a child is raped in the presence of the parents, that the healing take place in the presence of the parents. Partly because it's a communal, it's a group trauma. It's not just the child in secret. The trauma happened to everyone when they were there. So the treatment, it's appropriate that it happened with everyone when they're there. It is important to have a measure of authority in the family system. But it is more important to have compassion. So when the child cries and the mother cries and the father cries and they all hold on to one another and they all cry and maybe the therapist cries too, there is a sharing of the suffering that eases the suffering. The burden and the pain is carried not by one, two, it's carried by more. And so the child and the parents carry the pain together. The compassion that the parents display, the sorrow, the pain, all of it, even the father, especially if the father is able to cry for his helplessness and for his shame and for his sense of failure. If he is allowed to hold his child and they all hold one another, the family can heal and the compassion and the empathy will create a new kind of authority. It will be different. There is no going back to how it was before. Now it's different, but together the family organically will heal and respect for the parents will be organically restored. And then they will find themselves in a situation where the child knows they're vulnerable and the child knows they're helpless, but the child also knows that they will do their best. They will do anything they can, whatever they can, to protect the child. And that will help to restore the family bond and that will help to restore the father's role in the house, as well as the mother's role, which is very important for the protection of children. <sighs> Question three. Why does the Russian population support these rapes? I have no idea. I have no idea. I cannot believe what I have seen and what I have heard and read. I cannot believe it. It is such a basic human thing to preserve dignity. It is what makes us human. The preservation of dignity. 
We've heard a story of a wife, a soldier talking to his wife, and the wife is saying, yes, I give you permission to rape. I give you permission to rape. In my life, I have never heard of such a thing. Never. And I work with survivors of human sex trafficking. I have never heard of such a thing. I have no answer for you. What I can tell you is that that kind of statement and that kind of belief violates the fundamental core of every known form of humanity. I don't even know what to think about anyone who can say such a thing. Let's see. Ah, so this question, question four, is the question of um, mass violence and the open discussion and whether it's helpful or harmful to those who've experienced sexual violence. It's both. On the one hand, so many people have been raped um, that we now understand that genocidal rape is happening in Ukraine. So it's not just one person, it's not just two people, it's people all over the place. So it uh, reduces the sense of isolation that rape survivors can experience. But the other side of the coin is there's nowhere to hide. Having experienced rape, most people don't want to talk about it. Of course, they don't want to talk about it, but they have to talk about it because it's every, everything you read, everything you see, everything you hear. So again, it depends on the individual. Some people will find it helpful to know that they weren't alone. Some people will find it completely overwhelming and they will not want to hear any more about it. It will depend on the individual. Ah, what to do if the rape victim is not willing to undergo therapy and our voice cooperation with therapists do we have to? Aha, okay, so next week, um, we will talk about what I, I call the trauma resilience, the, the community trauma resilience pyramid. One of the challenges of mass trauma of this kind is the scale. There are not enough therapists in Ukraine to treat everybody who has been harmed in this war. The good news is that social support is the number one protector of human mental health after trauma. So it is very important to think about scale. So people who don't want to go to therapy for their rape do not have to go to therapy to recover from rape. They need something, but it might not be therapy. There are many, 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 many tools. I've been doing a lot of research into Ukrainian theater and music and drumming, knitting. Ukraine already has a lot of resources inside the culture that can be used at the community level to help trauma survivors, whether or not they ever go and see a professional therapist. Some might need to, some might not. It's important that they not be isolated and separate and in silence and shame. It's important that they learn skills for emotional regulation if they develop post-traumatic stress disorder, which many, 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 many people will. It is not necessary for them to do that in a therapist's office. They can do a lot of the healing work in the community itself provided that the resources already in the community 
are leveraged and mobilized for trauma recovery. Ah. So in the case of the mother being raped in the presence of her child, I would recommend starting with the mother first because there are two things that have occurred in that rape. She is raped as a woman and she is raped as a mother. So what we want to do is provide her with some resources and some skills and some grounding and some ideas that will help her be present and grounded when the child is invited. So the child needs to be brought into the process, but not right away, because what the child will want to see is not that image of my naked, helpless, screaming, crying mother. They'll never forget that. That's forever. They will never forget. What they need to see is after the rape, the mother that I saw on the ground is now a smiling mother, a laughing mother, a happy mother. So the mother needs to be able to show the child that she is going to be okay. And that modeling will assist the child's healing. It will not be everything. The child will also, if the child witnesses mother being raped, the child will need their own intervention for sure. But mostly what they need is to see that their mother survived and that she's going to be all right. And then they can move forward. I think that's it for questions. I think I got all six. Elena, is there any more coming through or are we at the end of the questions? I think it's uh, enough and uh, our lecture is already ended. Okay, time, we're out of time. The time we're out, out of time, of yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you all. I see that many of you stayed extra time, even though we went a little bit over time. I thank you for your attention. If you're able to, please join us next Monday for part two. If you can't join us, there will be a YouTube link for next Monday that you can catch it and watch it at your convenience. In the meantime, my heart goes out to all of you from my side of the world to yours. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Ми дуже вдячні, доктор Ліндер. До зустрічі наступного тижня. Thank you. Thank you very much. Дуже дякую. Щиро дякую. Обожаємо кого. Велика вдячність. Дякую. Женя, дякуємо вам. А коли наступна зустріч? Понеділок наступний, а по часу? Такий же самий час. Угу, дякую. Володько, підкажи, де можна запис буде переглянути? Подивіться, будь ласка, у телеграм-каналах, які я написала у чаті. Це всі рябої телеграм і всі про... Там є посилання на YouTube-канал, і так само в анонсі цієї події так само було посилання на YouTube-канал, де ви зможете знайти... Ага, я знайшла, так, дякую. Так, там наразі буде англійською мовою, згодом ми зможемо додати запис українською. Якщо цього не станеться, то я спробую додати українською мовою, щоб знизу був переклад. Дякую. Ми випадку не зможемо передивитися лекцію.
Посилання на конференцію буде те саме, що сьогодні чи нове буде? Так, так це постійна, постійне посилання на усі зустрічі даного проєкту про насилля. Дякую. До побачення. До побачення. До побачення.